I would quite like just to pick up on um, your experiences of, of playing. You both play. You play at similar levels. Same yeah, level, yeah, same level. So, um, how much homophobia have you have been aware of just playing football? Do you want to go first, considering you probably started a bit before me? Um, I would have said um, rare in the context of it. I've never played with any player that has come out openly gay. Um, never been involved in any conversation within the dressing room on what if someone does or anything. Not a single conversation has ever happened in my 20 plus years of playing. Um, but has there been homophobic comments made throughout my playing years? Absolutely. And the people using them will say it's a throwaway comment, it's a, a banterish comment, it could be related to, I don't know, a clothing item someone's wore for a team night out. So you'd get that homophobic comment related to the pair of shoes or the shirt or something like that. But which I would guess the people using it would say it's a throwaway comment, it's banter. But beyond that, nothing of um, on the pitch stuff. It's not really something that ever come across. And I was quite a, a confrontational player. I'd often get in confrontations with anyone that I was playing against, to be honest, most games, every game. And it really never, never really happened for me, but I know it does. Um, and I know for the first probably 15 years of playing adult football, I'm not sure I would have done anything about it, being completely honest. Because it kind of comes with the territory, I mean, that, that's, that's my assumption. And uh, even in you know, playing uh, women's football at uh, a you know, very um, basic level, um, you just, you know, it's a kind of go to slur, isn't it, on the pitch? To, to go there, is it? I mean, in your experience before you came out, have you, you, have you been aware of people yeah. using the F word and the P word and the, you know, that's so gay? Different F word. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good question because I experienced all the things that Gab's talking about prior to coming out. And for a lot of those years, prior to even realising that I was gay. So I would have even used those slurs. Uh, and that's me holding my hands up and being completely honest. It's part of the environment, it's part of the culture. I actually think it's part of everyday life as well as football life. I don't think it, it's exclusively a football changing room issue. Those types of slurs that can cause great offence to people is just everyday speech and everyday language. Unfortunately, in, in lots of sports, lots of cultures, uh, and lots of aspects of society. The interesting thing from my experience is whilst I would have used those slurs at times, certainly in the heat of the moment, I've certainly had them thrown at me a lot over the years. You know, I, I am vain and I pay attention to the way that I look, I go to the gym, I'm worried about my hair and I think I've always been a target for someone trying to get under my skin because like Gav, you know, I think he mentioned as soon as I walked in the room, he might not have got on because I am very hot headed, I say what I think and I'm one of the players that is a target for the likes of Danny White or Mickey High and my god Manchester who's famous for trying to get under my skin and wind me up and get me sent off. And, those types of slurs have been thrown at me a lot over the years for those reasons. But the moment I came out and said that I was gay, I've not had a single opponent say it. Not a single, I haven't heard it used it in anyone else's direction while I've been playing, and it certainly hasn't been thrown at me. So I think that says a lot, where there's a lot of differences between what people say to get a reaction or because of culture, and whether there's genuine hatred within a person. And I actually think that the good news is there's not a lot of the latter, but there is a lot of the former. I agree with you. I think that is good news because I think you know we're going to um, hopefully um, talk about some mechanisms that we might use to change the environment in football. And and that sounds encouraging, doesn't it? Because if, if one of the reasons that stopping, particularly men, who um, play football, coming out to their teammates, um, is just the general use of homophobic language rather than motivated by hatred, then surely that's something something we can do about. But the other thing that is you did say, you know, people use this language in other parts of their lives as well, not just football. But do you think it's my opinion is that it, we hear it more in, in sport, more in football than you, def you definitely do, but I think that's just because it's such a 
extreme environment. It's a 90 minute match or it's a you know, 30 minute change room scenario versus everyday life where you might see it in an argument or behind closed doors. But in this environment, it's competitive, it's a passionate environment. Like I said, people are looking to gain an advantage everywhere to win a football game. The most important thing to almost every player that steps across the white line is winning that game. And they'll take any route to get an advantage that they possibly can. Even if it's things that conflict with you know, normal moral compass, like getting somebody booked, getting somebody sent off, diving, giving somebody abuse for something, they, they all fall under that same category in my view. I am personally not a fan of some of them. Uh, I, will, I will never lose my temper to gain an advantage to get someone else sent off. I've never tried to get someone else booked or sent off. That's just not my character. But I've had it done to me, and I've reacted badly to those scenarios myself, that baiting, if you like, and almost giving the person what they want, which is for me to be off the pitch and having an early shower, um, and probably serving a suspension. But I've never been somebody that wants to, somebody to get booked or sent off, or I've never dived in my life. I've, really lambasted teammates who have done it even when they've done it on the same team as me to win penalties and everything else but people are different and you get different styles of player i'm a bit more old school uh, but there are lots of players who are far more skillful and have a lot more technical ability than i do that don't see that as an issue uh, particularly you know we, we at Thetford we've got a, a lot of foreign players and portuguese players and to them that's part of culture and that's good play to them whereas to me it's not, and I think the same thing applies to these slurs. That it's just looking for an advantage. And you're gonna presume you're gonna learn that, for, even if you didn't do it yourself, um, unless you've got a role model who's like showing that that's not the right thing to do in the same way as diving to get yeah. a, a pen. Um, do you think? Do you think kids learn well, to use I stuff to, to be part of the team? From my perspective. I made the comment I've been playing for 20 plus years, but for the first 15, I don't think I'd have done anything about uh, picking up on words that are used. Mm -hmm. And that comes with experience and education and my workplace and everything that the education I've received in the workplace has obviously given me more intelligence and experience to actually go, well, that, isn't, that throwaway comment isn't right. That's not what we should be doing because we're not presenting the environment for everyone to feel like they can be themselves. That's what makes me think is that have I played with players that have never felt comfortable in the environment that they're in? They're in it, they're, they're playing within it, but if, they, if you can't be yourself, how can you fully enjoy some, something? And a relevant that the level that I played at, you got a little bit of beer money, is what I used to call it. It wasn't my job. I'd done it purely for a hobby. And I'd hate for my teammates, who I'd have done anything for on the pitch, to maybe have been, I suppose, not themselves. And that's what hurts me, that maybe I could have done more earlier in my career to actually make people feel like they can be themselves. And I, I fear that maybe I didn't in, in, in my playing days. But I think there's a really important point there though, and if you link it to other forms of discrimination or, or abuse, uh, you, you can spot some differences with it. So for example, you just said there Gav, that you wouldn't have ever pulled anyone up in a change room for calling someone, you know, if, if we're not going to use the terms, the G word or the P word or the F word or whatever, because it was everyday insults and talks. But I guarantee you that you would have pulled somebody up if they ever used a racist slur in, in your dressing room and they called somebody the N-word or something like that. And, and if you take me as a case in point, my whole life, since my earliest possible memory, I've been staunchly anti-racist and I don't tolerate anything said in and around me to anyone that I care about in any way whatsoever. T to the point where it's actually got me in a lot of altercations over the years. And yet, as a gay man, I've never once pulled anyone up on using the G word, the P word or the F word that we're calling them now and I've just let that go and I think if you analyse that one of the reasons is because if you are using one of the racist slurs you're generally directing it at somebody so you are calling somebody of black ethnicity uh, the N word or, or something to that equivalent it's personal, it's out of order and it's, and it's, it's an attack whereas with the uh, sexual slurs that we have within the dressing room or within football, actually nine times out of ten they're aimed at people that either are not gay or that you don't know are gay and it's just like calling somebody a uh, knobhead, for example, it's become that common. So I, I think that 
for the person using it, it just flies off the tongue without a second thought. And for the person who, or the people who are seeing that and witnessing that, it just rolls off the back. It, it's not a, you don't have to stick up for anyone because the person being called it, in your eyes, isn't a victim of anything because they're yeah. not gay. They're... It's so interesting. It's like, um, I mean, obviously my experience of the whole has been uh, about watching football. And, you know, at, um, at Carrow Road and, um, and watching Norwich City play away. And as a, as a gay woman, hearing that um, abuse, which, is, as you say, isn't targeted at people because they are um, gay, it's used as, a, it's used as, as a demeaning slur. But in turn, that's demeaned me because being gay is used as an insult, the equivalent of yeah. not, not, if we're allowed to say, the K word. Is it an N word or a K word? It's an N word, isn't it? No word, yeah. I've said it now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's so. <laughs> so I was getting confused with the alphabet, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where we're at. We're allowed to just say. <laughs> we just say the words. Um, so that's kind of. I mean, that's a kind of education piece, isn't it? And I, I, you know, I think Gav, we all have regrets about not having stood up in the past, but. Um, Schools are so much better now that, that my feeling is kids are way more aware of what's mm. okay to say and what isn't okay to say and, and way more aware of um, homophobia and, and transphobia. Um, but yet yeah, there, there is something about um, extending that kind of challenging culture, isn't there? Um, and since lockdown, I know I'll, I'll get the go. I'll, go home from the shops some days and I'm kind of bored with myself because any time I see somebody not, you know, in a shop not wearing a mask or touching stuff and putting it back, I'm the one that always says, oh, excuse me, it'd be better if you didn't do that, you know why, it's a good reason not to do that. And, but I know, and I, yeah, I do get a bit bored with myself, but I know that if I did it, and I would, I'd, you know, find it hard to drop off to sleep at night because I know that I missed an opportunity to challenge and, you know, to, to help make uh, our society, our community a better place. And it's the same, I think, with that challenging uh, use of slurs. So whatever it is, whether it's racist, whether it's ages, whether it's sexist, you know, there's so much sexism that goes unchallenged. Um, but yeah. Coming back to, I know, schools are better at education but I still think there's a lot of work to be done. I've got a, a 12 year old stepson and in the heat of the moment it comes back to is it in the football environment or is it in the competitive environment? I think it's in the com competitive mm -hmm. environment because gaming is a competitive <laughs> environment. Right? So they will throw abuse at each other through their headsets, one to try and gain an advantage and two, to release the frustration of letting in the goal on FIFA or being killed in Fortnite or whatever it is, Rocket League at the minute is the new, new online game. And I have to pull him up on some of the words he's using, not necessarily the G word, but just language in general, when he's in that environment. Take the headset off, or in my case, take me off the pitch, completely different person wouldn't be throwing them comments out left, right and centre yeah. if he wasn't in that competitive environment. Um, so I know I'm picking him up on that, not as his stepdad or, or anything like that, it's just because I just don't want to see anyone in, in society that has throwing to be. all these comments out there to, to abuse or to let out their frustrations in that way. There's better That's ways to do it. great parenting. Well, still exactly. to do. He's still doing the same thing every time. I don't know how great it is. It's so. No, it's good parenting, but that's what you need. Is that you need, you know, the other voices that he's hearing in the headset to be doing the same, making the same changes because it's that peer influence, isn't it? You don't just suddenly start saying, "Oh, you f word," if if you haven't heard somebody else say it. Mm, definitely not, because I've got a five-year-old, and as much as he will be overhearing some of his older brother comments, that's not in his vocabulary at the minute. He, you know, he will do some competitive stuff. He's not gaming or anything like that. He will cope. I'll keep him away from that for as long <laughs> as possible. But it, it, it's just not terminology he knows at the moment. Uh, and 
it's just just that education and the more people we can get educating others the so, better it so is. many of these things are learned and to your point that's why younger generations are so much better than, than older generations with this if you, if you look at how my niece who I'm really proud of as a, as a human being how she approaches equality uh, as a mixed race girl uh, in sexuality when I came out she was almost proud that her uncle was doing what I'm really? doing whereas if you take my parents generation it was oh do you have to be in the newspaper and you know, okay it's fine you are what you are but do we really have to keep talking about it and it, it, those generations obviously they're so polar opposite ends but it is only because of education that my niece is how she is and not necessarily how my parents generation are and it's education it needs to continue we've come I believe a long way and it's important that we keep reminding ourselves of that but we have to keep doing that work otherwise what's the you know the next generation and it's not purely generational is it I mean again going back to Carrow Road and, and football fans and um, there is a kind of new breed of, of young fans who are kicking back at, at kind of um, liberal mm -hmm. uh, parents or um, the you know I mean Carrow Road is just a, a delightful family friendly place to, to be these days and there are more people who would challenge um, than wouldn't, I think. Um, so things are changing, but you're right, we can't, we can't be complacent. Um, my, my, one of my issues um, about that is that although things are improving and people's attitudes are improving, and that's partly to do with, with young people, um, there still aren't enough active allies. And you know that goes back to that that challenging thing, doesn't it? Um, I mean, you you know you've had a kind of um, uh, um, oh, what's the word when you suddenly have a an epiphany? Epiphany. You've had an epiphany. You on you. <laughs> <laughs> the e word. Um, and and so now you're uh, you're the kind of guy who would challenge. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Oh, I come back to something you said earlier, Matt, and it's just stuck with me that since coming out, you haven't heard the throwaway comments, the abuse. Now, my assumption and feeling on that is because people don't want to offend you. Not because they're intimidated by you, I don't think it's anything. I just think people just don't want to offend because going back to the throwaway comments, it's not because they really want to offend someone or hurt someone's feelings, it's just a learnt behaviour or learnt word that they know, I will call that person that. Um, so and, and I take that as a positive, that actually no one's really meant, ever meant any harm most of the time, not everyone, but most of them, no one's really meant any harm, and then they realise actually that might cause you some harm, then they're not using that. Mm. So you've got to take that as a positive, but that doesn't mean that's the, the task you've done. The task has just started, there's no one near It's done. positive. But the kind of corollary of it is that unless you know that it, somebody has come out, you assume that everybody you're playing football with, certainly in the men's game, isn't gay yeah. or bi. Well, the bigger concern is if, and I still find this bemusing, that I'm the highest playing footballer in the UK that's openly gay, I'm certainly not Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, so that in itself is a concern. But what's happening in all of the other leagues, above and below me, where there isn't an openly gay player, does that slur continue because Matt Morton's not on the pitch? Because I'm, I'm not going to offend him or he doesn't intimidate me, whichever reason it is? I think the fact is, you kind of answered your own question anyway, surely. The fact that those, none of the players at any of those clubs have come out like you have, it must be the case. You know, no, um, no player has come out during their, their career in this country since Justin Fashion did 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And and he was just an incredibly brave guy. You know, he dealt with racism. He had the, the National Front was around when he was a youngster in Norfolk. Um, I think he, he punched someone in Great Yarmouth on a National Front march. Good for him. But, um, you know, so he was dealing with that. He was dealing with being a foster kid. He was excluded in so many ways. So I think he thought he was tough enough to come out as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of things with that. I agree with you completely. I think it's incredibly brave. Uh, but I think there's also probably part of, of his psyche where in that era he was getting racial abuse all of the time So actually me being gay Am I going to get additional abuse? I mean you can't say two things at the same time So there's probably an element of coverage on that 
But also the reaction that he got for coming out, I think is actually as brave as it was, part of the reason it's taken so long for people to do it again, because he suffered a lot of abuse, mm -hmm. both for the colour of his skin and mm -hmm. for his sexual preference. And ultimately, I think that people will look at that and think, do I want to put myself through that? Do I want to get that abuse? Because mm -hmm. there is a big difference between the two subjects. You cannot hide being black. If you're black, it's there. You have two choices, especially back then. Play the game and receive the abuse and, and improve the lives of future generations because your shoulders are broad enough to carry that. Fantastic, that's great. Or don't play the game and walk away. What I've seen since coming out is the amount of people that have messaged me saying they've given up the game because they'd rather do that than be in an environment they're not comfortable in, mm. deal with rejection if they did come out, and ultimately not feel that they could play the sport. Now, it's a really ironic scenario that because they've taken themselves out of the mm. sport mm. through fear of being ostracized from that very sport. Mm. You self sabotage. But the fear of the reaction and that rejection is too much for people to take. So they just, the consequence they were most scared of, they self-inflict on themselves anyway and walk away from that. And ultimately that is because you can't hide being black, you can hide being gay. And that's why it's so far behind. Okay, so, so we've worked out that um, language doesn't help, the, the language that you hear routinely playing football doesn't help people who are thinking they might want to come out. Yeah. Um, and, and you know we should be able to deal with that shouldn't we we've got refs you know we've got um clubs uh you know most of the people in the game are smart people people can unlearn that behavior people can stop using those slurs but what about that fear of rejection and do we think that um other footballers in, in particularly in the male grassroots game would reject their um fellow players if they came out hand on heart, I don't think they would. But you can't speak for everyone, can you? Um, but you've played with a lot of different guys. I, 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 I am confident that if anyone came out in the sides that I played in, it would have made absolutely no difference to the environment, to how they felt within the side. Um, but that I think it's always based on who's the biggest characters within that dressing room. Okay. Who are the dominant voices? Because there's always a few dominant ones. And you've got all of the different types of characters. And I know I was probably the probably one, two, three dominant characters in all of my time playing at Roxham. I was I maintained being there for twelve years and I was always probably after the first three years where you're the young person you then start to find your way in the side. After that, I know I would have been one of the most dominant ones, organised all the social nights out. Um, so it would have been ideal. So I'm fairly, fairly confident fairly. when saying that um, and knowing who the other dominant characters were and who the captain was and all those sorts of things, I knew them as people and I know how we would have controlled the environment and if there was any opposition, we would have just stamped it out and that pre the person or the people that were against it wouldn't have been at the club, wouldn't have had it. Because the bigger picture is they're not the right people you want in your side anyway. However, I can only speak, you can only speak for yourself Matt, and for you, the environment. I mean, obviously you've had a, a brilliant reaction, lots of support. In the time that you have played, can you think of um, sides that you played for or people that you played with that um, it wouldn't have been so easy? I think it's tough to say what would have happened you know, in hypothetical situations. What I can say is what has happened in my situation. And I agree with all the points that Gav just made. There are always one, two, three, four voices that are louder, more dominant in terms of personality than everyone else. And the rest of the change room will look to them for a reaction. And they will set the tone for what that reaction is. If you take our changing room, Clearly, yeah, I'm one of those, but you have Sam Bond, who is the captain again now, um, and various other voices in there. And fundamentally, these are good people. And if you are representing anything that is not good, in, in terms of morals and, and you as a human, your moral compass, racism, homophobia, all, all of those things that, that just wouldn't sit well with people like that, you wouldn't be playing for that football club. For a start, you wouldn't want to be in that environment. The type of person we're talking about, they find strength in numbers. And 30 years ago, their numbers were greater. Nowadays, they're the minority. Yeah. 
and it's a great position for us, the rest of us, to all be in. But unless they can find people that are equally as racist, uh, as hateful, as homophobic as they are, they won't want to be as vocal, even if they feel it. They are acutely aware that they have to be careful because ultimately they're cowards. Yeah. They're insecure cowards. And because of that, they need other people like them to give them a platform to feel confident to voice that negativity. And that ain't gonna happen around me. No, that's, that's so true. And you're right, they are in the minority. And if we can amp up that, that challenging behavior, um, then you know they, they're gonna look elsewhere for, for their um, support, aren't they? Yeah. Um, other people to pull in. Diocracy, a lot of, I suppose your work is in the professional game, isn't it? Through being pro Canaries and Norwich City and the Free Lions and now professional football, we know there's fundamental problems there that we've got no openly gay professional footballer. Footballers really is where we should be at at this point in time. Now, I don't know whether you've had ever had conversations with professional players on the matter. I have. I've spoke to some professional players on the matter because I can't get my head around it. Don't understand why we're still in this situation. And I don't want to name names because it's not right for me to name names, but they are, they, they are fully aware of gay players playing in, in the top divisions. They know who they are. Um, they, they've got the full support of the players that they play with, the players that they play against. So the players aren't the issue from the conversations I have with, with, with professional players. It's the fact that they don't want to deal with the added pressure and what may come from spectators, pretty much, in the main. And, and that's just a sad place to still be. Yeah, it, it really is. And, uh, you know, um, the thing that um, Justin, one of the things Justin didn't have to deal with was, is social media. So it's not just about spectators who go to games, it's the fans, you know, so-called fans on, on socials, isn't it, that uh, they're a concern. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a professional player, um, but my feeling is that they have to soak it up. And Matt was talking about use of slurs that, that's, you know, inappropriate target. And um, remember Graham is so, um, there are other players as well, you know. That's something that plays that comes with the territory, and if if you can't deal with that, then you're not going to excel at the top level anyway. So that's kind of my take. I'm not saying that we should allow it to go on, but that's my take on on dealing with you know um, abuse from the terraces. I I imagine that more of a concern is going to be where are you playing this time next week? You know, you can go out on loan at the drop of a hat, can't you? You could be going to a country where and the, the laws aren't the same as they are here in terms of protecting um, your rights as a, uh, as a person with your LGBT plus. Um, and I, so I think you know, there's loads of work we need to be doing with um, agents. And there are clubs that are still pretty toxic, you know, even uh, in the top um, echelons of the game. So um, you know, there's still, still work that we need to do. There um, something that happened recently, and uh, when we talk about footballers being out in the in the elite level, I always ignore MLS, and I've got American friends who really give me a hard time about that. I don't think MLS is elite. I don't know, is it? Um, but I one thing that happened recently with um, the San Diego Loyals was um, Landon Donovan taking the whole team off yep. when there was a, a, a homophobic slur, and it was targeted at a, an out gay player, uh, wasn't it, Colin Martin? Um, and um, the ref didn't deal with it, and the um, manager Landon Donovan took the whole team off. And I just think that was just brilliant. And if we can build in that, I mean, that is um, challenging and championing at the at the top level, isn't it? It's so public. Um, it was in all that you know. It was in, in the news globally. Um, that's that's what we need to do. And we, actually, we need um, the the FA. Um, and FIFA to be to be enshrining that kind of response in um, the legislation. Um, I think the appetite has to be there, though. Like like with any of these things, I don't know if either of you two watched the Anton Ferdinand documentary mm. this week. Did you see that? Unfortunately, not. But it's on my uh, plan. So it's, it's when I get a telly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great watch, but it, it's an emotional watch. Mm. 
and some of the things on there are captured in broad daylight on social media, the things being tweeted directly to Anton Ferdinand in the wake of that, bear in mind he was a victim of racial abuse. Uh, they were disgusting. And whilst I don't have all of the facts around every individual tweet that was sent to him, what I do know is that a good proportion of those, there was no action taken. And are you telling me that if somebody really wanted to find who was responsible for those tweets, they could be held accountable? So this is a police issue, this is a football association issue, because that football fan is the one that's tweeted that. It's not going to be somebody who has no interest in the game. So why can't we impose sanctions on people that feel the need and the right to take to social media, to actively abuse players or anybody for their skin colour, their sexuality or their sex and gender is beyond me. And until I think that we're all willing, not just players, whether gay or straight and in support of that, but the FA, the national governing bodies, the, the kick it out of the world, all come together along with the police in this country to actually impose proper sanctions for this type of toxic behaviour. And until that happens, is it really going to be a, a environment that people feel genuinely comfortable to come out in, particularly at the top level? And I think the answer to that is no. It will take somebody with a big set of balls, so to speak, uh, to say, do you know what, I don't care. Call me whatever you want. You're going to abuse me for something anyway. Like me before, I will still get abused on the football field. I just now probably, well, so far, haven't got it for my sexuality. I get it for everything else. Um, people will get it for, you know, their missus, their mum, anything else. They're things that are just completely fantastical and not made up, but they're jabs at people to try and get under their skin. So my message would be, if your shoulders are broad enough, if you want to be a trailblazer, if you want to really ignite change, you have the opportunity in the Premier League, the Championship, whatever, to come out while still playing the game and start to knock down barriers because, you know, it's never going to be easy for whoever goes first. It hasn't, you know, been a, an easy process for me either, even though my reaction's been great. But the, the build-up to making that decision, to, to taking that stance, is something that people will always consider the pros and the cons in, in doing so. And for me, the pros outweighed all of the cons massively. Uh, and it's quite thrilling for someone with my personality, actually, even if I got abuse for it, to be able to say, well, do you know what, I'm making a difference to other people, and people that go after me yeah. are, are going to appreciate this. And I would rather have that in my legacy than, oh, I came out when I finished playing because I was worried. And, I think there have got to be people playing at the top level that have that exact same ethos, that exact same mentality. Mm. Uh, it's fantastic. It's just so yeah. brilliant. Such a brilliant role model. And um, thank you so much for for coming out and and being so articulate about it. Um, I was just going to add the high probability is people don't shouldn't have to do it alone. Yeah. The high yeah. probability is there's more than one, isn't there? Uh, yeah. like, this. You shouldn't need to be do you shouldn't be needing to doing this alone in the national league system yeah. or you know, the hundreds of clubs that we've got in the national league system, you're the highest playing and manager to be out openly gay. It's just yeah. crazy. It, it gives me a massive inflated ego to my ability, <laughs> that statement. I mean honestly, I've never felt so good. <laughs> and he's a head it and kick it centre up. I am, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I'm yeah, going to ask you about, um, so apparently, uh, just to pick up on your, your point about um, online hatred, there's a new uh, new legislation in development uh, on online hatred law, hate crime law, uh, so watch out for that um, coming out in the next, or it's been um, finalised in the next few months. I was just going to bring some context to, obviously I'm not sitting here just as a past player, I'm sitting here as the chief exec as well. So as a county of fact, we have the ability to deal with participants and people really struggle to get their head around what is a participant. So for example, so someone could come into here, watch some of the games here, throw loads of abuse out, that gets reported to us. Now if that individual isn't a participant in the game, so a registered player somewhere, a club official, or say a, a, a coach of a side, we can do absolutely nothing about their behaviour from a football context. And people really struggle, well why can't you do some, well we don't have the powers, obviously we would want that reported to the police that therefore should have the power, 
if they've got no role in, in, in local football, yeah. we can't do nothing about it. Now, they until, can pay, if it's at a club level, you can penalise the club for not yeah. managing their sports spaces. Yes, in the main, but they'll be a club. you can eject someone from the premises because you can do that to yeah. anybody you don't like on the premises. Yeah, um, but so actually, you want to be able to, we, we would want to be able to charge, punish those individuals, and the punishment needs to start to become education alongside yep. monies and bans or whatever it is mm -hmm. because most people aren't that bothered about the 30, 40 pound fine or whatever's thrown their way. I see what they are bothered about though, continuing to, to come to venues like this come, and do yeah. that. And, and that's where I think that, you know, would I, would I advocate that any FA, whether it's county or national, gets the ability to fine a member of the public I don't know, I think that's a grey area. However, do I think that the FA at county and national level should have the ability to stop somebody going to any football ground to spectate in their sport? Absolutely, 100%. And that will kill the attitude of a lot of people because this is where they bend. This is where they come and feel that they're free to give the abuse out that they want to. They feel like it's their right. Yeah. Um, they've had a, a really bad week at work, they've had an argument with the missus, they come down to a football game and they scream abuse at people playing the sport for 90 minutes and go home and then they're fine. And, and that, to, to cut that out, you need to stop them being able to come to the games. And if the FA don't have that power, then it's going to be very difficult to control. Yeah. What, about, um, what about, I mentioned it briefly, what about the role of officials? Uh, I mean, we're lucky, again in Norfolk, we have some out, um, out officials. Yeah. Um, we, could do, we could do with more. I'm um, not sure that everybody uh, who is gay and uh, an official feels comfortable being out. Um, I'm not sh actually, I'm not sure that enough LGBT people come into um, refing. Um, people in general that we don't have enough to. Well, we have challenges yeah. to, to and, recruit and referees. And maybe we've done some kind of world, recruitment but... initiative in the LGBT community. I don't know how crazy that that sounds. Well, we've talked about role models, haven't we, and talked about let's you know try to inspire let's try to inspire change let's try to inspire people to want to either get back playing the game again because you've spoke about people contacting you say i just took myself out of the environment that i just that sort of breaks my heart to a certain extent people i do this job though. that's a really good point i do this job because i want people to play i want people to to referee i want people to coach i want people to generally volunteer and love doing it you know and for people to go i'm just not going to play football because i don't want the added pressure of being a gay person playing football just can't be the case and that would be exactly the same for refereeing and I, and if people are saying that in footballing terms i don't doubt if there was a referee that decided they wanted to come out i wouldn't be surprised if they took themselves away from that environment of refereeing if yeah. they then wanted to come out um, so we've got to keep trying to inspiring and Matt should know this, you are absolutely a role model for, for gay and straight footballers, um, whether you'll be a role model for match officials, because most of no, them probably I, don't like no, you, no, no, um, no, they didn't like me either, no. so I won't worry. And, <laughs> They know, I know, turn up to referee CPD and so I really didn't like it. Yeah. It's all right off the field. They all think I'm yeah. all right off the field, but I hope they do. Um, we, but we, we need to create, role, you have to create role models in my yeah, opinion. We, I think we, they have a massive impact on people. Yeah, more match officials. And, and match officials can be addressing that use of language, that yep. it's systematic, institutional really, fo football language that you don't hear. Um, like you say, it's condensed into that 90 minutes. Um, and they can be addressing uh, language they hear from spectators as well. You know, they can stop the match briefly and everyone else is going to get on those folks' backs. Um, so yeah, I was going to say, um, I was saying that um, last year the match officials and, and a lot of grassroots clubs, um, men's and women's, and um, youth as well um, in this county did wear rainbow laces. It was um, really well taken up. Um, and it was one of the best in the country in terms of the county FAs. Um, engagement with rainbow laces. What um, I've got my oh no, it has unravelled. <laughs> my rainbow laces broke. Oh, I'll have to wear them as laces now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wonder what you thought about rainbow laces campaign. 
Um, I've got a lot of feelings on it, to be fair. I, I struggle to criticise it because it's there to do good. Um, and, and I think it does do some good. But is it the answer to all of the, all of the problems? Is it the solution? No. I think it's one of hundreds of things that need to change and take place in the sport for us to get real change and progress. And Thomas Beattie and I have spoken about this as well, and, and he's got some interesting views on it from when he was a player. Would he have wanted to take part in that? How would that have made him feel sitting in the dressing room wearing rainbow laces as a in-the-closet homosexual man? And he was very paranoid about that and conflicted by that. And he just would have said, no, 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 no I've got nothing to do with me, etc. And I think it's a really interesting psychology because you have to look at this, I think, from two different sides. First of all, from the, the straight players and then from the gay players that are in the game. And if those gay players are out, then clearly they're going to be fine with it. Uh, if the straight players are not in the closet and they're genuinely straight, are they going to be conflicted and think, well, people might think I'm gay if I wear the rainbow laces, so I'm not going to. I think there's definitely going to be some that will. And, and if you're in the closet, you're definitely going to be paranoid about that, about supporting this because you draw attention to yourself. So I think it either has to be a, a widespread thing where it's not up to each individual player of whether they do it or not, but then do you lose part of the, the quality of that message if it's something that's enforced? Is it just something that, well, we wear it because we have to, so actually what's the strength in that message at all? So it's definitely got its challenges. Um, I remember I actually wore them once and it was, it was the season before I realised that I was gay. It was my first season at Thetford. And uh, Danny White actually brought in some rainbow laces for some of the players to wear, and he was going to wear them, and Mort, you wear them, you wear them, and then others will wear them. So I was like, okay, fine, put them on, wore them, he wore them. I think we were the only two that bothered wearing them. That wasn't because the other players were either homophobic or were worried about being labelled gay. They just couldn't be bothered. It's a faff, isn't they it? Couldn't Change be bothered. laces. Yeah. yeah. Um, Wes Ulan kept his in his boots for, I mean, they've got a, t a kit man, haven't they? But he kept his boots for three months after mm -hmm. um, Rainbow Laces Day. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I remember handing some out outside Carrow Road, and um, it's the kind of thing where I thought, well, some people are going to say, ooh, no, you know, and kind of recoil because of the association with yeah. being gay. But actually, and increasingly, I think over the years, people really love them, they really like because they're so colourful and um, kids love them as well and there doesn't seem to be that association with ugh gay or that's so gay or maybe kids are just smarter these days. I think everyone's different though aren't they and I think fundamentally we know rainbow laces alone isn't going to change, make the big enough change in the environment to become more inclusive, we know that, it's just got to be one of so many other things that need to change for people to feel more comfortable in the environment that football presents itself. That's, that, that's for me. So um, what, what would you like to see um, as a county FA us do and what do you think we can be doing? Should we go first or second? I'll follow you this time. Uh, so I, I think it goes back to the point that Gav mentioned before is what powers they've got. I personally don't think that a, a lot can be done from a player's perspective until people within that change room come out and then they'll realise, I think nine times out of ten, that that dressing room is accepting and is positive to, to that revelation. I think that the two biggest concerns are boardrooms at higher levels, uh, relatively archaic still, in, in even in the modern era of football, uh, and also spectators and until the associations and the NGBs have got power to do things about spectators rather than just players and participants I think there's going to be a challenge. I think the higher you go, again like I mentioned earlier it's about appetite. So I know for a fact as I work in technology now there is great technology out there that's available and there is a lot of money in football. So why is there technology not implemented into stadiums at higher levels that can pick up at voice recognition level where abuse has come from and what those keywords are? We can monitor people's telephone calls in various countries around the world and there are trigger words for terrorism that are picked up upon and there can be a, a knock on somebody's door if that counter-terrorism department has picked up on them. So why can't there be a uh, counter-homophobia division within football that picks up on that in stadiums, a counter-racism division? And there can be, is the answer, but it's about appetite and investment. 
And if we really want to tackle this issue and the wider issues seriously around acceptance across all of these areas, then we need investment and we need appetite to do that. Okay. I wish I said not to follow that, to be honest. Well, there are already things, <laughs> there like, are already yeah. things that we're doing that yeah. other counties aren't doing. I mean, we have um, the uh, standard for inclusive, uh, LGBT inclusive grassroots teams. Yeah. Uh, only one of the clubs, I think, we've got at the moment has got that. Yeah, but that's something on, that yeah. we started in Norfolk. Um, and we've talked today about um, trying to recruit uh, match officials from the LGBT community, trying to get people who've left football because they didn't feel comfortable coming back. We talked about um, trying to manage language. Those yeah. are all things. Uh, and we're now talking on. about role models, and this is sort of the start of the process for me is you know finding people that want to be role models, uh, advocating them, supporting them um, to inspire others, and. I don't necessarily think it has to be a gay person trying to inspire other people to come out. Yeah. It needs to be straight men, straight with, you know, people just making people go, I will be accepted in whoever I am. Um, so I, I know alone, you can't be the sole role model for people to, to yeah. want to come out around their sexuality. Yeah. So me sitting here having this, this discussion, I think it's part of the process and people should want to do that. And I saw the reaction you got, Matt, and I know some of the players that spoke about how proud they are um, of you being their mate, being their current teammate or past teammate. Um, and obviously I pick up on the people that you're already connected with on social media. You then see those sort of conversations um, and that's what makes the difference. And you m might realise how much of a difference you're making or not. You're making a difference through what you are doing and not just speaking about it once. You're speaking about it, for me, what it looks like to whoever's willing to speak to you about it. Mm -hmm. And giving up your time freely to... to oh, you're not paying me for this. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> um, just to, you know, get the message out to make it better for others. You're not doing it for yourself no more. No. That's why I see it. This is a selfless act for others to to feel comfortable in the environment that they are doing their hobby. And football is just one hobby, one environment that we want people to feel comfortable in. We want that happening in all walks of life and in all environments for society to be a better place. And, and I'm not exaggerating, but you are saving people's lives. You know, there are still young people um, self-harming, self being bullied, and take, attempting to take their own lives yeah. because they can't deal with who they are, or we can't deal with who they are. Society can't deal with who they are, and that has to stop. You know, and if the root of that is about, you know, the the basic root of that is people not vetting and um, not screening their own language you know if that's the, the kind of start of, of that self-doubt and that anxiety together we, you, we can contribute to but you really are you know by being you by being out and playing football you're, you're saving people's lives well i appreciate what you what you both said uh, i think that for me the one message that i give to people is that you need to talk and even if that's the one person you don't have to you know, talk to the Times or be on Sky Sports or anything else if you're not comfortable with that. But if you talk to one person, and I'm going back to the very early stage of my realisation back in, in January 2018, and you know, I know I'm a strong character, I've got a big personality, and I don't really care what people think as long as I feel like I'm in the right. That's my biggest issue. If I'm in the wrong, I care what people think. If I'm in the right and I'm confident with that, I don't really care what anyone thinks. But not everybody is like that. So going back to that period in my life, that first few months, and, and even somebody with my character is, is feeling isolated, feeling like they can't talk to anyone, feeling like, what the hell does this mean, what does that mean? That talking to that first person about it openly was like a... <sighs> so what somebody who does care about what people think or, or is worried about what people are going to say, going to feel like in that same situation, 
the first and most important thing in this is to talk to somebody. Even if you have to pick somebody that you trust implicitly, somebody that you would view as a safe person to tell, do it. Because it will make you feel ten times better and in my view, that is one massive step from taking somebody to a point of, I don't see any way other out other than suicide, to I'm going to be okay at some point. And, and that's the message that I want to really get home to everybody in, in any situation. Yeah, yeah. And that's the key thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're questioning your sexuality or anything. That could be just, you've just got this bit of cloud hanging over you and everyone can go through that period of time. But until you just start to speak to someone about it, it's, it's not going to clear. Yeah. yeah. So just, just... Yeah. Speak. And it might not, I mean, you might not be, uh, you, we're talking about extremes, people might not be contemplating, you know, taking their own life. Um, but they might be thinking about quitting football. Yep. Um, and they might be c continuing to play football, but underperforming. Because yep. they're so busy thinking, they're using up so much energy thinking about denying who they are. Yeah. Um, that, that, that their athletic prowess suffers uh, as a result. So, you know, that, that's, um, that's a, a brilliant way to start, find somebody. And so the more people around there are who are uh, comfortable about uh, approachable, um, the better at, at club level. It can affect you. Uh, I remember there, there was one game in particular before I told the lads and we were playing Haverhill Borough away. They'd just got into our league and they were playing on the 3G surface. And I was going through a particularly difficult thing in the first kind of on-off relationship that I was ever in with a guy and obviously nobody knew about it and uh, e even this one confidant was was actually only just aware and something had happened and I had to go to a football game and normally you walk in the changing room and I'll say something to a few people and you know I'm quite loud I walked in the changing room didn't want to talk to anyone I did not want to talk to anyone and, and partly that was because I I just didn't feel sociable I was very down and the second thing was I, I thought, knowing me, someone says the wrong thing to me, I might explode and I don't want to do that to a teammate. So I just kept my mouth shut and was in one word answers and took myself off, did my kind of warm up at the side and, and I, I remember hearing that, I was like, what's, Mort? what's wrong with Mort? Mort, are you alright? Yep. And then after the game I, I sat in the bath because I thought I have to have a drink anyway before I go, but I sat in the corner, I was on my phone and yeah, a couple of them came over and said, you all right, do you want a drink? I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good. And then I went. And I remember that was a bit of a realisation to me that you, you, can't, you can't keep this to yourself because this will not be the first problem that you've got that you don't feel that you can talk to anyone about. There will be more. And if you're, if you're bottling all of that up, it will affect your performance, it will affect your relationships, it will affect everything. And, and as someone who was a leader in that dressing room. I wasn't a leader that day. I was the opposite. So I, I'm not only affecting my performances, I'm affecting my team's performances potentially. Because when your back's up against the wall, if we had gone one nil down in that game, who, who are the people that they're looking to, to get you to work harder, to get you to, to lead by example, to get back in the game? I wasn't one of those that day. You would have looked at me and looked right through me. And that's not the person that I want to be. It's certainly not the player I want to be. So people do need to talk. And a problem shared is a problem halved. And actually, probably in a lot of cases, not even a problem. Maybe an advantage. Yeah. Yeah.